So thank you for the invitation to speak to you this evening. Um, this is actually my first formal speaking engagement as General Secretary of Churches Together in Britain and Ireland. And when I got the invitation from Elizabeth, I thought, well, it's very appropriate to start with the Society for Ecumenical Studies. And then Elizabeth brought me this suggested title of Unity Churches Together Making a Difference in Today's World. And I thought, well, that just couldn't be more apt because this is a theme that for me personally is very close to my heart and is just um, such a clear expression of my focus as I take up this post for Churches Together in Britain and Ireland. So just maybe a brief word about my background. I've come to this role after five years heading up the Irish Council of Churches. And prior to that, I worked for eight years in the Catholic Bishops Conference in Ireland, where I was responsible for the Justice and Peace Office. So I suppose I've been on this trajectory of coming to ecumenism through the work of Justice and Peace, and then with a particular focus on peace building in the Irish context. And then more recently, seeing the significance of the collaboration in the British Irish space. And so although I'm new to the role of General Secretary, I'm not new to CTBI and was involved in that work during all my time in the Irish Council of Churches. So I'm just going to jump straight ahead to the conclusion of my talk and say that I absolutely believe that churches working together can make a difference and a positive difference in today's world. As we watch the news, read the papers or even chat to friends over coffee, we see and hear all around us stark evidence of a world that is in urgent need of reconciliation, healing and a renewed solidarity. There's an important opportunity for churches and ecumenical bodies to make a difference if we have the confidence to believe that we have something worthwhile to offer, but also the humility to know that the Christian voice is only one amongst others in an increasingly diverse and pluralist public square. In setting out a vision for interchurch relations on these islands, I believe we need to strike a careful balance between ambition and sensitivity. We need to be ambitious to continue to build on that very encouraging increase in ecumenical engagement witnessed throughout the pandemic. We want to keep that momentum into the next phase of our journeying together, whatever that might look like. And it is precisely that uncertainty and the awareness of what we've been through as churches and communities as a result of COVID-19 that makes it necessary to balance our ambition with great sensitivity to the challenges that face our member churches, especially in terms of pressures on resources. The pandemic experience has prompted us in many ways to a new reflection on the place of faith in today's society. At times, it has appeared that the importance of spiritual well-being for Christians and other people of faith as part of a holistic understanding of health has been overlooked or misunderstood. At the same time, churches have been conscious of our responsibility to protect the most vulnerable, and there have been encouraging examples of community outreach by churches, often as part of wider societal partnerships. There are common questions being raised across the different jurisdictions on these islands about how the learning from this experience might shape our work priorities and practices going forward notably in relation to how we engage with government and public authorities. So as I begin my reflection on the potential for the work of Christian unity to make a positive difference in today's world, I want to share an example from my experience in the Irish context, something that gives me hope in terms of the leadership potential of ecumenical relationships. So what you're seeing in this photograph is a scene from May 2019, and it shows Christian church leaders making a joint presentation to the talks process that was aimed at restoring Northern Ireland's devolved institutions. Space was created for religious leaders to address the negotiators from the political parties, together with the co-chairs from the British and Irish governments. They were invited to do this because they had undertaken as an ecumenical initiative to convene a series of civic dialogue events in different parts of Northern Ireland 
which brought together civil society leaders with a cross-party panel of politicians to discuss the impact of the suspension of the Northern Ireland Assembly and how civic leaders could support political leaders in working for its restoration. What is significant about this for me is that firstly, no one denomination acting alone would have been given a space to make an input into a formal political talks process like this. But the opportunity was not created solely by ecumenical engagements, but also by the willingness of church leaders to bring other voices and other perspectives into the process through their dialogue initiative. The other encouraging element was the willingness of civic leaders to accept the church leaders invitation. So what I take from this is that when church leaders come together in response to societal need, they are still regarded, even in the context of an increasingly secular society, as honest brokers, because there's still a level of public trust in Christian values that gives churches a convening authority to initiate wider public dialogue. And this is reinforced by the unity and diversity they model when acting together. So to say a word about the vision for CTBI's work in this area, I'll briefly share a few key themes to start our conversation. For many people, CTBI is known for the resources we provide for ecumenical engagement at key moments in the church calendar. So already this year, we've had Week of Prayer for Christian Unity and Racial Justice Sunday. We're reflecting on the learning from the Climate Sunday initiative that we ran ahead of COP26 last year, and we're currently promoting a Lenten resource. In shaping our work plan, we prioritise those issues where collective engagement across Britain and Ireland. In partnership with the four national ecumenical instruments on these islands is a critical element of that process ensuring that our work is not only shaped and informed by the needs of our member churches, but that it's meaningful across the different jurisdictions on these islands and adds value to what the national instruments are doing already. Our approach builds on a foundation of relationships that are supported through the creation of spaces for fellowship, dialogue and reflection. It underlines the need for all that we do to be supported through prayer and for concern to translate into collective action. There's a strong emphasis on the development of networks that draw on the experience of other faith-based organizations to ensure that we make best use of all available resources so that work is sustainable and not undermined by what some consider competition within the faith sector. As a body that seeks to bring Christian churches together and channel that work of Christian unity, to contribute to the shaping of a more just and compassionate society for all. CTBI has a role and responsibility in drawing on the collective experience of our members to identify the factors that can see people pushed to the margins of our society. We seek to build on the unique contribution of the collective voice of the British and Irish churches in the public square to raise awareness of social justice issues. That includes engagement around some of the most challenging issues of identity and belonging, which has led us in recent years to reflect together on the challenges arising from Brexit, the debate around constitutional futures on these islands, and the need to protect the peace process on the island of Ireland. Throughout the pandemic, we've seen an increase in both the frequency and variety of opportunities for British and Irish sharing and cooperation. The challenge for us now is to build on these to achieve a lasting deepening of relationships, demonstrated through meaningful action and solidarity. One of our areas of focus is to look at what combined British-Irish perspectives can offer to the wider global context. In that respect, I'd just like to share about an international project that I've been involved in. So over the past year, I've taken part in this project, which is based in the Centre for Religion, Human Values and International Relations at Dublin City University. So it draws on the publication that's shown there in the image, which is called On the Significance of Religion for Global Diplomacy. And this is examined primarily from the experience of religious leaders 
but in dialogue with others, including academics, other civic leaders, and representatives of multilateral institutions such as the UN. So the authors of this publication have argued that at this time of transition, what might be considered an inflection point in our history, those tasked with finding global solutions to the major challenges facing the whole of humanity could benefit from the support and input of religious leaders. At the same time, they argue that religious leaders need to be thinking strategically about how they engage on these questions, recognizing the value of what they have to offer while also acknowledging the shortcomings in their own leadership. So then the project follows on from the book in convening a series of round tables. And through these wide ranging discussions with a diverse group of participants, we've considered the potential contribution of religious leaders to addressing issues such as threats to democracy, to multilateral cooperation, to justice and peace. Questions of leadership and values, particularly in our global context. The work of building community with particular uh, uh, emphasis on supporting civic engagement from the grassroots level right through to the international stage. And the whole area of spirituality as a contribution to well-being. And the findings to date have been both challenging and encouraging. It's widely recognized that religion remains a powerful force in shaping imagination. The research project is one of many across these islands that I've been contacted by in recent years that are asking questions about the role of religion and belief in public life, with some adopting a very specific focus on how those tasked with shaping public policy can engage with faith leaders. The work underlines the importance of investment in the area of interfaith dialogue, which is a priority area of work for CTBI. But also to think beyond that in terms of how religious leaders engage with secular culture. Often we lament the decline of religious literacy in the public square, but this work is encouraging us to think more in terms of the development of a mutual literacy between the religious and secular spheres without, of course, undermining or diluting what is distinctive and authentic about the Christian perspective. Developments in the global church context provide further opportunities for this kind of reflection and engagement, notably the forthcoming Assembly of the World Council of Churches and the Synod and Synodality in the Catholic Church. So I'm aware that this audience will be very familiar with these, and I'll just make a brief comment on the relevance to the theme that we're considering this evening. So with the WCC Assembly, the theme chosen for the 11th Assembly encompasses all of the issues that we've highlighted in the presentation so far. The organizers say, in this fragmented and fractured world, the assembly theme is an affirmation of faith that Christ's love transforms the world in the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. Against the powers of destruction and sin, the assembly theme affirms that the love of the compassionate, crucified and risen Christ is at the heart of this world. It is a radical call to the churches to work together unceasingly and with people of other faiths and all those of goodwill for just peace and reconciliation. It is a call for the visible unity of the church to become a prophetic sign and a foretaste of the reconciliation of this world with God and the unity of humankind in all creation. There's a real desire for this coming together, particularly since the assembly itself has already been delayed because of COVID-19. CTBI supports our member churches in preparing their delegates for the assembly. And what is perhaps of, of interest for this meeting of the Society for Ecumenical Studies is that one of the concerns that has been articulated globally is the decreasing investment in the whole area of ecumenical studies and formation and how this impacts an organization like the WCC when it's trying to prepare delegates to engage in consensus-based decision-making on complex and sensitive issues. At a continental European level, CTBI is supporting member churches to engage with the preparatory work that's being undertaken by the Conference of European Churches. The pre-assembly meeting organized by Keck in February 2022 
will take a particular focus on relationships between church and state and church and society in a context of increasing secularization, drawing on the learning from the pandemic experience. Keck has been reflecting on the contribution of churches to the public discourse on values in a context of decreasing, decreasing religious literacy and asking what might be distinctive and unique about the European perspective when considered in the wider global context. Then we have the synodal process currently underway in the Catholic Church. The relevance of this, given the theme of communion, participation, mission, is really evident, and I know has been picked up in reflections from this society to date. I just want to emphasize three points in relation to this. First of all, the significance of the ecumenical pillar of this process, as reflected in Bishop Farrell's statement for the week of prayer for Christian unity this year, where he said that the synodal process is an opportunity for every diocese and for every local community to open their doors to a new and deeper ecumenical relation in their area. Secondly, how closely the work of synodality, founded on deep listening, rebuilding trust and relationships, and a rediscovery of discernment as skill and practice, supports the kind of work that I've mentioned throughout this presentation, and how that has been reflected in the personal leadership of Pope Francis, which has really resonated with people from other Christian denominations and other faiths. And lastly, uh, in terms of the, the Four Nations context on these islands, in addition to the Universal Synod, there's also a national synodal pathway underway in Ireland. And as a member of the Catholic Church, I will be one of those responsible for leading this work. And I'm really hopeful that Ireland's national synodal process will produce further opportunities for ecumenical engagement on these islands. And I think it also highlights what we're seeing to date, just how closely the skill sets that people are developing through the work of ecumenism also translates across into the synodal process. And we see that also in terms of other processes of discernment, dialogue, reflection, particularly around contentious issues within other denominations. So to conclude then, if we agree that the Christian vision of reconciliation has much to offer a wounded and fragmented world, how might we best work together to realize that potential? I suggest some themes for us to consider partnership, because partnership working to make the best use of resources, but also critically to make visible our shared values is an essential foundation. Dialogue, because in my experience, there can never be too many spaces for a good quality dialogue that is characterized by deep, respectful listening. And when we're talking about ecumenical dialogue that is supported by prayer, Reflection, because we can often get so caught up in the actions that need to be taken, and understandably so, that we fail to take time to reflect on the deeper significance of what we're doing and why we're doing it as an expression of our faith. Analysis. One of the benefits of ecumenical cooperation is that we can pool our resources to achieve good quality analysis around some of the major societal challenges that we are attempting to respond to as churches. And in doing so to highlight the unique nature of the Christian contribution to public debate, but also as one voice amongst many in a pluralist public square. The promotion of ecumenism. Because while in some respects, ecumenical engagement is increasing, and this is really encouraging, as I've said already, in other aspects, the investment in this area appears to be decreasing. And I think if we're going to take best advantage of the opportunities that are presented with, to us in the present moment, we need to be really intentional about promoting ecumenism. And this is especially so if we're to recruit a new generation of leaders challenge to the churches, because ecumenical engagement should support churches to engage in self-critical reflection and acknowledge the shortcoming in their own leadership and bring that humble leadership collectively into the public square. And finally, shaping the language. 
I think the educational work and outreach of this society is an important example of the kind of support and resource that's needed to give people the language to explain in the challenges of an increasingly secular context, how their work for the common good is an expression of their Christian faith. We should not underestimate the complexity or the scale of the challenges we have before us. The pandemic experience has demonstrated the resilience of our faith as a force for good in society. And now we need to draw deeply from that well to renew our efforts for the work ahead. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Well, thank you very much indeed. That was really wonderful and helpful. And I think it's, it, it addressed those issues that we're facing, uh, as you touched on, about ecumenism being something that's in a way been parked somewhere else and not of relevance and value anymore. I've been interested, I've been writing uh, the United Reformed Church this year is celebrating its 50th anniversary and I've been in, invited to write a chapter on the ecumenical developments of the URC over the past 50 years. And so I've read the General Re Assembly reports and I've been struck by the diminishment of the ecumenical involvement in the URC. And it was ecumenism that brought us into being and helped us to unite different traditions. But the, uh, that has kind of diminished and we've been overtaken by other insights. Um, and orientations. I, I was uh, particularly interested, do you think it makes a difference coming from the Irish perspective to uh, speak in Britain? I was kind of wondering whether the church uh, traditionally has more of an impact, has had more of an impact in Ireland than in Scotland, Wales and England. Um, so I was just curious if I could uh, be so bold as to ask that kind of question. Uh, but then I want to open it up and I invite people to put a question in the chat or otherwise to um, wave your hand at me and then I'll make a note of your name so that you can make a point or ask a question. But if I could just start off by asking Nicola about, do, do you feel that being in the Irish context or coming from that has made a significant difference and will help us in the British context to develop our thinking about ecumenism? Well, I mean, there, there's no doubt that uh, the Irish context brings a unique perspective to this, particularly in terms of the challenges of our peace process and the very real awareness that that brings of what the consequences are, the failures and breakdowns in relationships. I think we have probably made more of that in recent years than we have previously and I think that's partly due to the challenges of Brexit that's shone a new light on some of these issues. So as I mentioned in CTBI we have been creating a space for reflection on some of the challenges arising out of Brexit and then some of the questions that stem from that around constitutional futures, issues of national identity, belonging, social cohesion. And one of the things that's um, one of the, the standout moments, I suppose, in that was an intervention from the church leaders group in Ireland who requested to CTBI to host a meeting where they could speak to their counterparts across the, the UK and explain what the challenges of Brexit looked like from the island of Ireland perspective, particularly we, we had contributions from bishops of cross-border dioceses who were explaining that reality of cross-border living, how it had been transformed by the peace process and the risks of what we could slide back to uh, with some of what was potentially on the horizon coming out of Brexit. Um, and Certainly some of the reflections from church leaders um, across Britain was that um, they were challenged by what they were hearing um, in an Irish context, uh, but also encouraged because they saw things like the example of the church leaders in Ireland getting to give the input into the talks. They saw collective letters 
being produced around um, issues to do with Brexit or when we had the resurgence of violence here last year. And they said, you know, it really showed the potential for church leaders in really grasping the nettle and open up, opening up the space for conversation. Um, and so there was some critical self-reflection from religious leaders that perhaps when it came to the Brexit debate or issues around the potential um, and the referendum and Scottish independence and the potential for that to come back again, that they had perhaps been overly cautious and could have been more proactive in drawing on you know, the, the resources that we have in our Christian faith and that experience of being community and particularly um, through our interchurch work in using that to, to create spaces to explore those conversations in a way that it's different to the kind of debate that people are seeing in the media. Thank you. Um, now I could go on myself, but I'm, I want to give opportunities for other people. Um, is anybody else would like to raise a comment or a question or um, just put your hand up or put something in the chat. Um, I think one, one of the, so while I'm waiting to see if anybody would like to do that, um, one of the, the, the many questions and issues that I have is um, how, how far does a, an ecclesiological dialogue about the nature of the church help us? in our mutual growth and understanding. Uh, I'm just aware that we come from a variety of different backgrounds. And I, I recently co-chaired the International Reformed Anglican Dialogue. And one of the issues there was to say that our previous uh, report from that dialogue in 1984 was, uh, one of the issues was, was it uh, too ecclesiological and did it need to be more mission based? Um, and then there was a debate about, well, what does ecclesiological mean in terms of our understanding of our different traditions? And are we um, accepting a separation of different traditions and that understanding? Or are we looking at some of the issues which have separated us and thinking, how can we work better on some of those issues? And I just wondered if you had anything to comment on that. Well, it's one of the areas that's been highlighted by the WCC in preparation for their uh, assembly as an area that needs attention and where there's some potential for controversy, where the lack of understanding between member churches of the WCC around different ecclesiologies poses challenges for their working together. I think it's something while um, in some areas, you know, the uh, such as the, the examples that you cited that, uh, you know, I have heard the criticism that it's too much focused on ecclesiology. I would say in my experience, the, the National Ecumenical Instruments is me speaking personally. I think it's one of the areas that very often slips off the agenda and that we can be very focused on our working together, what are the things that we want to do, and we end up tackling the big social issues, and that's all really important. But it comes back to, I think that uh, the point that you're making, Elizabeth, is encompassed in some of what I was saying about getting that balance between the action and the reflection. Um, I don't hear very many people bringing those questions around ecclesiology and exploring together different ecclesiologies to the table of the National Ecumenical Instruments, although I am aware of, you know, there are initiatives that are happening in parallel between individual denominations or small groups of denominations, but even to bring in, sometimes I've tried to outreach to bring in some of the fruits of those reflections, bring those to the wider table of the National Ecumenical Instruments. Um, and so far, I haven't seen a huge appetite to, to develop those conversations. So this is where I think, you know, through the partnership working and people raising these questions in other spheres that we are challenging each other, it means that there's less of a risk that say in the National Ecumenical Instruments that we end up having a blind spot or, or a gap in this area. 
And, and I suppose, uh, yes, sorry, um, uh, Mary Tanner. Yeah, have I unmuted myself? Yes, you yes. have. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very, very much, um, Nicola. Christine Jack, I, I, I'd just like to pick up um, the theme of the assembly and some of the things you said around the theme of the assembly. Christ's love transforms the world. Um, I think I want to say Christ's love transforms the church before I say Christ. And, and the church is transformed in order to work for the transformation of the world for God's sake and for the world's sake. Um, and then you went on to say that the visible unity of the church is to be the sign for the world. Um, and as the conversation has gone on between you and Elizabeth um, around what the ecclesia or what the visible unity of the church might mean, I wondered whether the faith and order text, the church towards a common vision ought not to be brought in at this point because that's an attempt by the most representative ecumenical group there is um, to actually begin to portray what visible unity might be. And synodality belongs very much in that context as also does primacy. So I just wondered what you thought about working a bit more on the church towards a common vision. I agree wholeheartedly and it has been quoted in ecumenical contributions to the process of synodality in the, the Catholic Church, certainly. And I think, again, it shows the importance of having that good foundation around training and reflection, but also the institutional memory so that we don't go back to the start and keep reinventing the wheel. So um, yes, wholeheartedly, I think that's a, a timely reminder. And uh, as we are about to gather the British Irish delegates at the end of March, I think that's something that should be part of our, our discussions there as well, because what we've been saying to our member churches and to delegates is about you know, the importance of preparation. This is a unique opportunity in the context of a WCC assembly. We need to think about what we bring into it. And that means proper preparation to engage fully with the theme, but also with the methodologies, because there are a variety of different methodological approaches that are used in the course of the assembly. The more you understand about the history of the journey that the ecumenical instruments have been on nationally and globally, the better placed you are to engage and enter fully into the spirit of that but also to think about what it is that we want to take away. And if we are going to make the most of whatever might come out of that assembly, then we need those really strong foundations in terms of understanding of relationships and the networks that make it possible for us to, to bring those to life in the British Irish context in whatever way is appropriate and in the way that makes the best use of the experience that we have available and everyone's resources. Thank you. And Christine Jack had her hand up. And then if anybody else would like to put their hands up or put something in chat, please do so. Christine, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was just thinking about your the last section when you talked about working together to create a hopeful vision for the future. Um, and at the top of your, your list of, of, of issues to think about, you put partnership or shared values. Now, I just wondered if you, if you could sort of itemize or put more detail into that. We talk, we talk rather widely about justice and peace. And sometimes I find these words rather grand, actually, um, because they, 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 they encompass such a wide uh, you know, variety of ideas. And most of us don't actually live in a particular area of conflict. Um, so what, what, what shared values or areas of partnership can you see the churches uh, working together for the common good? So from a CTBI perspective, the, what we have identified as being the, the common thread that seems to run through much of our work plan is themes around identity and belonging. So what are those factors 
that leads to the fracturing of our local communities, the weakening of the, the social fabric and cause people to feel marginalized. So what the, one of the main areas where we take a lead is on the work of racial justice. So CTBI had a long standing uh, leadership role in this area around Racial Justice Sunday. And then obviously what came out of the, the Black Lives Matter um, and other um, issues and reports that were associated with that made um, some of those issues uh, a, a new priority for our churches. So that's one specific example. Uh, we work on issues around a socioeconomic um, inclusion and justice, but we tend to do those in partnership with other areas. So that's one area where up to now, the um, national ecumenical bodies have been leading in partnership with those faith-based charities that are working in that particular jurisdiction, because so much of that is around um, advocacy to government and the um, specific areas of legislation. But what we've realized in looking at this through an identity and belonging lens in recent years is that you know homelessness is a big issue across all jurisdictions on these islands and it comes with issues around identity and belonging. So there may be an added benefit from doing something on that, say in a, a British Irish context and bringing that perspective. Um, the work of uh, with uh, both a, a local and a global fo focus would be the work of the church's refugee network. And that's another area where we've been very active in pulling in what's being done through the, the national ecumenical instruments and then using our positioning to put the issues in a wider global context, as well as joining with others and issues around refugees, um, the, the refugee and asylum system. Um, so those are just uh, a couple of issues of some of the, the specific areas that we're talking about. Thank you. Can I can I go on, Elizabeth? Just just yes, yes sure. Sure, because I, I come from a, an angle that I feel is often neglected in this sort of conversation and in this company, is, is that you know, to, the issues today which are affecting people, people are worried about, are the issues simply like the climate, the climate crisis, actually, um, especially in areas where I live and, and, and globally, very much so in, in other areas, parts of the world. But no, we're British and Ireland, aren't we? But we'll keep it local. Um, and I, I always find, what about, what about, um, you know, the shared covenant, oh, this is actually I'm, I'm, two things here, the shared covenant with creation that we have. Um, I always feel that that is neglected in this, in this um, conversation and in this area of ecumenism. So we support the work of the Environmental Issues Network and in the run up to COP26, we led on the Climate Sunday initiative which was really positive in lots of ways. So it brought together lots of different faith-based organizations and churches in that space and got people working together rather than working in silos on, on different aspects and with different approaches. So that was something that was really encouraging. What was also really encouraging for us on that specific issue was that we saw churches who are not part of CTBI because they are not uh, warmly disposed towards ecumenism, um, actually availing of the Climate Sunday resource because they were interested in engaging around um, ecology and safeguarding of creation and particularly um, in the run up to, to COP26. So it brought in for us a new audience who were interested in climate justice, but not ecumenism. Thank you. Do you want to pursue that further, Christine? I think it's a, it is a really interesting issue. Um... <laughs> Um, no, not at the moment. I'll, yeah, I'll no, no, hope somebody else might come in on, on maybe take that further as well. And before I launch in again, um, is there any any other question? It, in a way, I was interested. Oh, sorry, Alison, Alison Williams, please. Yes, um, Nicola said that uh, interfaith relations were also a priority for CTBI. Could she tell us a bit about that in detail? 
So we have uh, two bodies working on interfaith issues. So we have an interfaith theology advisory group. So they provide theological resources to support the work of interfaith dialogue. And they're looking at a range of issues. Uh, recently, they've been looking at the area of gender justice and they brought out a publication last year, Her Faith Matters. So they're starting to open up some of these sensitive questions around gender justice in an interfaith context. So that's been a, a really interesting area of work. They're looking at uh, shared prayer in the public space. So particularly how faith leaders can come together in civic space, uh, for example, at moments of shared trauma in a community. Um, they are also looking at uh, specifically the area of Christian Muslim relations and uh, the question of Islamophobia. And that builds on some very good work that was done in previous years with the Jewish community around anti-Semitism. Uh, and then alongside that, we also bring together at different points in the year those who are tasked with leading interfaith relations work for the different denominations. So again, that's one of the, the networks. So we bring them together, give them an opportunity to get to know each other, support each other and identify issues that are of shared concern where they might like to work together or could benefit for some additional support and resource in terms of the reflection that supports that work. And um, Christine again. Do you mind that as it's, as it's quiet, if you mind, I can, can I come back to the climate issue a little bit? Um, uh, and maybe can, is it at all possible or of interest to take it out of the out of the climate justice arena all the time as well, and simply look at um, look at it as as a part of of the pastoral care. Um, so that when, when we're caring, we're also caring for the planet and for the earth as well as for our human selves. Um, so the, you know, it's it's more than a justice issue. I feel it's a it's a whole way of looking at ourselves more holistically and the world in which we live. Can we sort of get can we sort of get rid of the justice the whole time and just look at simple widening our sense of care? Yes, I think that that is uh, a helpful reflection. And I wondered whether I could just go back to something else that came up in the, the exchange between um, Nicola and Christine, which was about those churches which aren't part of churches together in Britain and Ireland. And I, I realised I don't actually know how many churches are not part of CTBI and um, are there, uh, whether there's initiatives that go to try and be more embracing of churches that don't feel ecumenism is a priority. Um, I just wondered where that's that one might go. Um, so, I mean, as was um, reflected in that finding around the the Climate Sunday initiative, so we were encouraged if there are churches who you know, would not ordinarily be engaging with us, who find in something that we're doing a way in and something worthwhile that sparks a conversation. So. I would say in broad terms, the, the door is always open and we very much welcome those opportunities for engagement. We don't have any specific plans or strategies for engagement around this um, at this point, but that's not to say that in our evaluation, for example, of what came out of the, the Climate Sunday initiative, which is still ongoing, that that might not be one of the the strands that we um, look to, to pick up and see whether anything further could be done there. And then just in general terms, you raising the profile of the work and you know, there's always a, a kind of a spirit of, of invitation to, to engagement behind that. And I suppose I'm just interested in how our ecumenical bodies are um, continually growing more inclusive of different and diverse views but that are still within the Christian context because it feels like it's a bit of a challenge in a way about 
are we, how inclusive are we in our thinking and our understanding? Or have we got to a point as uh, Christian churches where we think, well, it, it, everyone can get on with whatever they feel called to, but, um, it, and it's, so, it's less important that we do that together um, and that we, we just accept that people do, Christian churches do do things separately instead of having a drive towards doing things together more effectively for our world? Well, my experience in recent years has been that the, the churches have been focused on doing more together. And I think there are um, both positive and negative motivators for that, you know, positive in the sense that Yes, people recognize that we are, you know, the, the work of unity is part of our Christian calling. And I've heard a positive desire across different national ecumenical instruments and certainly in CTBI to be more inclusive of a range of different voices, um, particularly thinking in terms of um, different national identities, racial diversity, um, being more welcoming and understanding of different cultures, but also moving from uh, welcome to belonging. So not just saying to people, you stranger are welcome here, but actually you belong and you're part of us and we will adapt um, to, to be able to make the most of your um, perspective and for you to really feel a, a part of this. And so I'm hearing more of this and I think it's been more intentional in recent years and certainly in Ireland very recently the um, National Ecumenical Bodies partnered with Evangelical Alliance and others to undertake some research about how well the Irish churches and ecumenical bodies were doing in terms of that moving from a culture of welcome to, to belonging. Um, and I think the, the negative aspect of that has been that, um, you know, in the context of an increasingly secular society, government wants to speak to the faith sector as a whole across different jurisdictions. And so there's been an impetus for churches to work together. Uh, also, when you have increasing pressure on your resources, it makes sense to, to pull those and work together. So I think there are a number of factors there that are across many different areas, you know, really strengthening that desire to, to work together um, and in many ways a, a strong commitment to it and an openness to seeing how that can be more diverse, more inclusive. Um, but going along with that, the other issues that we've already identified in terms of um, just not quite the energy that we would like to see around actually promoting ecumenism and not the intentional focus on developing the, the study and the formation. Thank you. Melanie Burnside has raised her hand. Hello, yes, uh, and that was going to be my question, actually. Um, so you led into that quite nicely um, about the promotion of uh, ecumenism. I've uh, just recently been ordained. So while I was training, I went with um, a group of uh, Anglican ordinands to Bossy, um, 19 of us out of a cohort of uh, 500, I think, that year. Um, uh, but speaking for myself, um, I, I, I tried to get people interested in my training place, 70 odd uh, ordinance um, and, and very little interest, really. People, you know, perhaps understandably in their training focused on, um, you know, on their own uh, specific ecclesiology and kind of getting their head around that. But, um, you know, what is being done? What what can we do? Um, I think unless we tackle the perception that ecumenism is an add-on and something that you do on top of your your normal work and not something that is a, you know a, an integral part of the life and mission of the the local church, whatever your role may be, whether you know that's an ordained ministry and lay leadership, etc. Um, that 
that is always going to be a limiting factor because people will perceive it as non-essential. Uh, and I think, first of all, just intentional in naming that as a, a challenge. I think um, resourcing issues as well, you know, the, the level of investment. So I know that for some people, if you're having to take on additional study in terms of ecumenical formation then it's not just time but it's often money as well so the the finances being available to support that um the time uh whether it's built into people's um tra initial training continuous professional development opportunities whether it's something people are encouraged to do through sabbaticals um as well as just the ordinary informal relationship building piece. And I think that's something that for me, um, again, is one of those reflections that maybe comes through more in an Irish context that we sometimes underestimate the value of friendship in all of this and building friendships among clergy um, and uh, lay leaders and congregation members uh, from different denominations. So it's more striking in the context of Northern Ireland because it's less expected. But we find that, uh, for example, in those conversations when church leaders, a group of Protestant and Catholic church leaders was addressing politicians who were not able in the initial stages of that initiative to get around the same negotiating table, and they just came in and initially talked to them about friendship. And one of the lines that stayed with me was one of the church leaders said, you know, our friendship enables us to go together places where it would be very difficult for us to go as individuals. And I think there's a real value in that. And when it comes to just um, making that work of ecumenism more visible across the, the wider church, I think that's something to bring out as well that it is about friendship as well as obviously about study and formation and collaboration and all of those things. Thank you. Anybody else raising their hands? I'm just trying to keep my eye open for people who want to speak before I launch in my next question. Because uh, one of the questions I have is, uh, and I was having a kind of exchange with a colleague uh, recently about one of the dilemmas is that in Britain and Ireland actually what we are is Wales, England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Ireland and so working together and collaborating together is quite a challenge because people feel that they're going to do that within their nation as it were whether that is Scotland or Wales or England and so doing things collaboratively that go across those all those nations it has become more difficult and I wondered whether as you take on this role of General Secretary of CTBI how far you perceive that as one of the challenges this sort of separation and uh, in a way localization um, on a national basis across these nations instead of thinking we're one big whole. Well Partnership with the National Ecumenical Instruments is a critical element of that because we don't want to be simply duplicating their work or doing something on a British-Irish basis for the sake of it. There needs to be a clear added value and that's brought out through that dialogue across the different ecumenical instruments. Um, so the, the experience of meeting more frequently throughout the pandemic has definitely supported that because you can have shorter, more regular meetings. So it helps people build up more of a, a picture and more of an understanding. It has definitely sparked people's curiosities, what one area being how the different uh, national ecumenical instruments relate to government in the different jurisdictions and what we can learn from that. And um, where uh, it's in a multi-faith context, where um, those forums for engagement include humanists um, and what are called the philosophical organizations and where they don't and how that changes the dynamic. So all of that has been interesting and has given us a foundation to build on. But something else that came out really 
clearly was the whole issue of borders as a focus for our reflection as well. Um, so people across GB had mentioned how Brexit and Brexit coming together with the pandemic made them more aware of borders than they had been previously. Obviously on the island of Ireland, we've been very aware of borders, um, but you know, the common EU membership and the common travel area and all of that really took the border out of Irish politics and Brexit put it back in. So we've been having some interesting conversations around that. And one of the things that came out was that the, the churches really just went along with the whole process of devolution and, you know, the reconfiguration of British Irish relationships and didn't really reflect on what a Christian perspective might have to bring to that. And we're saying now that where there is this renewed focus on borders and viewing that as well through the lens of challenges around refugee and asylum issues, what might a Christian theological reflection on the issues of borders um, and you know, the, the concept of the kingdom of God, what might that have to offer and how might that open up a different space and a potential for some reimagining, some creative thinking? So yes, certainly challenges, definitely a need for partnership, um, but where we create the right atmosphere, environment, get the right focus and some scope for creative thinking that lifts our eyes up from the immediate um, context and again helps us make some of those deeper faith connections in a way that we possibly weren't doing when we were focused on advocacy to government around specific pieces of legislation in a particular jurisdiction. And in a way, I was also curious in, in what you were saying earlier on about um, relating to the secular context, because it does feel like sometimes in the West, secularization is kind of taking over and uh, the church is a bit in retreat um, and that secu the secular world is becoming larger and larger. So I was interested in what you were saying about uh, that photo that you showed and that sense of, uh, of a dialogue between the society and the church. And um, I just wondered if you'd like to say more, whether you feel that is going to be positive as we move forward in uh, churches together in Britain and Ireland, that we will be able to have a more positive dialogue between the secular world and the church in which there is a sort of a mutual understanding and engagement or whether the secularization uh, area is going to go on growing. Well, as I said, I mean, I know the Irish context is unique, but in some way, you know, in the context of a, a political crisis, there are more challenges to the role of churches as conveners potentially. And so as someone who was involved in that initiative from the start, I was really surprised by how far it went and just really encouraged when we issued that invitation to civic leaders, we're talking about you know, people who work in education and health, who head up a, a range of different charities, business leaders. Um, nobody really, nobody said no, nobody said I'm not accepting that invitation because it's coming from church leaders. And I think there were two factors. One, it is an important issue. It's a conversation that needs to be happening. And no one else was stepping forward to take it because it was so politically charged. Um, and when church leaders came together and the critical thing about it was that the invitation was framed very much in a context of humility and we're concerned about these things. We know you are too. And if it's helpful, we're, we're offering a space. And for me, that model is something that will work in other contexts and on other issues. And I do see some of it in the work of racial justice. And you know, much of that traces back to the church's engagement around racial justice and the, the church's response to um, particularly acts of violence that were sparked by racism. And I think again, where the churches are modeling a unity and diversity and showing society a way of dealing with 
um, some of these challenges, framing the debate, bringing people in. Um, I think it has huge potential to, to unlock conversations. And I think that was um, some of the, the learning and some of the challenge that was taken from that in the context of how we approach these debates that are coming down the line again around constitutional futures. Thank you. Well, we're coming to the end of our session, I'm sorry to say, um, I just wanted to check, does, does anybody else, would anybody else like to make a comment before we round this off? Um, put your hand up if you've got something. I think it's been it's been really fascinating, and I shall certainly follow the work of CTBI with even greater interest as it moves forward under the leadership of Nicola. And I just feel really encouraged by um, all that you've been saying, and I also feel encouraged by that sense of the dialogue with Ireland and the way that might actually open up new insights for us in Britain. Uh, I think that's uh, encouraging as well, and how that idea of friendship um, might grow. And because that seems to me to speak of the God who's love and how do we live in love for one another and not just in arguments for one another and uh, disagreements and so on. So I uh, thank you very much for taking the time at this early point in your appointment uh, as the general secretary. And we do, I'm sure on behalf of uh, us all, wish you well in all that lies in front of you. And we've had a couple of positive comments from people who've had to go and say how grateful they are and thankful they are to you for what you've said. Uh, we do hope to have the recording available and if you've got a text we hope to have that available because we know there's always people who can't actually make it on the evening at, but would like to know what is being said or to read about what is being said. So and I'd like to thank everybody for participating today and, and coming to be with us and uh, listening together. And um, just to close uh, with a, a brief prayer, let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks that your love embraces all people and helps us to become friends and to see new insights and wisdom offered by people from a variety of backgrounds and traditions. We give you thanks for the work of the churches together in Britain and Ireland and for Nicola in all that she will be bringing to the future of CTBI in the time that is to come. We give you thanks that for all that we've heard today and all that we've been able to share and pray your blessing upon each one of us that we may live more close to you, more open to you and therefore more open to one another and living in your way for the sake of your world. And this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So thank you again Nicola. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's very good. Yes. <laughs> and that just remains to me to say farewell and good night. <laughs>